afternoon, everyone. Welcome to an um, important lecture of the uh, this semester. Uh, I want to welcome uh, a very distinguished uh, Professor Holland from uh, Ball State University in the US. Um, it's an important event because our democratic transitions, as you know, are pretty delicate and uh, are not guaranteed to be successful. And most of us who do comparative politics, international studies, we know um, how fragile some of these processes are and um, with no guaranteed outcome uh, or of success. So uh, there are many such cases which have either become frozen or have been reversed uh, since the so-called third wave of democratization of the late uh, 20th century. So um, indeed, Myanmar is uh, at the, I think, the real laboratory to understand whether such um, uh, historic changes can actually happen or not. Um, and um, at Jindal School of International Affairs, as you know, we have a Center for Southeast Asian Studies headed by my colleague, Professor Nagin Parkinjan, who is a um, um, Professor Holland student, um, but uh, also spearheading our own understanding of this complex nation, which is, of course, a neighbor of India. Um, although it's not part of SARC, and I always believe that uh, there's a case for Myanmar to be part of SARC, but um, uh, it we, we share a land boundary, and uh, we have uh, many people of uh, Burmese, uh, Myanmar's origin uh, in our own uh, country on the Northeast. And uh, of course, uh, it's very vital for India's national security, and um, for also its activist uh, policy and so on. So this is a country we can ill afford to ignore. Uh, as much as many of us are concerned about pivotal nations like Afghanistan, um, I would argue that Myanmar is also pivotal for us. And uh, the more we understand it, the more we understand the, um, uh, the challenges and the opportunities as the uh, lecture is outlined today, the better off we are. We have read Nagin Pao's books um, and we continue to uh, uh, hope, I think, um, with some caveats that uh, Myanmar is still relatively headed in the right direction. But we don't know yet. Um, just this morning, Pope Francis gave a very impassioned um, um, speech uh, criticizing the atrocities and the impunity happening in Rakhine State against the Rohingyas. So, uh, and then there are so many other um, minority, ethnic minority groups whose uh, status remains unsettled and uh, still up for negotiation with the central government. Uh, and then, so these two, as Nagin Pao has argued in his works, and uh, we will of course hear from Professor Holland, the ethnic settlement and the democratization are uh, intricately linked. And you cannot see these as two separate issues. Um, so um, we are really fortunate that Professor Holland has come and uh, he's a very distinguished expert on this subject and um, has worked in policy making in academia for many, many years. And um, we hope that he will also have some advice for India, uh, this being an Indian university, about how we should um, calibrate or recalibrate our strategy to this uh, pivotal state. So, Thank you, sir. Thank you for being here. Please give him a round of applause. <laughs> Guest, uh, Professor Holland, for his lecture. And she also uh, works with me in Myanmar. And uh, we were here uh, two weeks ago uh, visiting the uh, School of Management. And so it's a great pleasure to, uh, to return and to have the opportunity to talk to such a distinguished audience about a subject that I feel very passionately about. And also very grateful to Professor Kipkin for arranging uh, our visit. Uh, he's one of our products uh, from Ball State University and we're very proud of him. Uh, let me say a few words about uh, my involvement uh, with Myanmar. Uh, as you may know, uh, in 1988, the military regime uh, brutally cracked down on the student protests. And as a result, uh, the United States uh, broke off diplomatic relations uh, with the military regime. 
but in 2011, uh, the regime began to make some changes uh, in a very positive direction toward civilian rule and democracy. So uh, our Secretary of State, Hillary Clinton, uh, visited the country to explore the possibilities of reopening relations, and that was followed by a visit in November 2012 by President Barack Obama. I was then contacted by the State Department and asked to come uh, and be part of an official delegation of higher education leaders. And so I joined a delegation of 10 U.S. universities and we uh, toured the country in February 2013. And I was asked at that time to make a promise to the people of Myanmar and I chose to promise that I would help reintroduce political science um, because political science had been banned as a subject uh, from the universities by the military government in 1962. And so I'm very pleased to say that in October of last year, we had an official ceremony uh, in Yangon announcing the return of political science. Um, so uh, I felt uh, very, very satisfied that we were able to deliver on that promise. So that's a positive sign that, uh, that we can point to. Is the PowerPoint there? So I will review the uh, struggle for democracy uh, in Myanmar. And uh, I should point out that the United States government does not recognize the name Myanmar. Uh, so in the United States, we still refer to the country as Burma and we uh, call the capital Rangoon. So if you hear me going back and forth uh, in terms of terminology, you'll know why. So it's definitely a struggle. Um, it's a very uh, you know, incomplete process. We don't know what the outcome will be. Uh, we can go back uh, to 1962 uh, when General Ne Win uh, led a military coup and overthrew the democratically elected government. And in the coming decades, the military regime was extremely repressive, uh, stamping out all forms of uh, freedom and were especially uh, harsh on the student demonstrators. Um, so thousands of protesters uh, uh, were put into prison. Uh, many were killed as well including, as we'll see, uh, Aung San Suu Kyi, who was also placed uh, in house arrest. But uh, in 1990, the uh, government decided to hold elections and allow the National League for Democracy to contest those elections, and the outcome was very unpredicted. Um, uh, the party under Aung San Suu Kyi won a resounding victory, uh, winning 392 seats out of the 492 um, that were contested. But the military government did not allow her to uh, take power. Uh, they invalidated the election and put her under house arrest. But the reform process did begin again um, about 15 years later. And then in 2008, a new constitution was adopted. The first elections under the constitution took place two years later but the NLD did not participate because they said the electoral laws were unjust. However, two years later, uh, the same year that uh, President Obama uh, came to Myanmar, the first president to visit the country, the NLD did participate in the by-elections and won all of the seats. So this was a sign that the process was beginning to thaw. So Aung San Suu Kyi herself uh, was elected as a member of parliament in those uh, March elections, uh, April elections. Then uh, under the Constitution, elections were held uh, five years following the first round. So uh, in November 2015, the NLD contested the general election and again won a resounding victory, a very large majority uh, in both houses of parliament. And you see what happened to the ruling party, uh, uh, the one associated with the military. Uh, it 
numbers in the uh, lower house fell from 259 down to 30, and in the upper house from 129 down to 12. So in February 2016, the newly elected parliament was sworn in. Uh, the parliament's duty is to elect a president, uh, and it elected Mr. Han Cha, uh, who was uh, sworn in in March of 2016. Uh, here's a photograph of Aung San Suu Kyi on the day of the selection of the president. And do you notice anything interesting about this photograph? Who is she surrounded by? <laughs> yeah, so always keep this in mind. She cannot do very much uh, without the support or at least the um, approval um, you know, of, the, of the military. This is a very difficult situation for her to be in. And it's, uh, you know, she's being very, very cautious. Now, you say, well, why isn't she president? Well, she's not president because the 2008 Constitution prohibits her from assuming the highest office. Um, the military wrote a clause into the basic law that says no one uh, who's married to a foreign citizen or and no one whose children uh, hold foreign passports can be president and that applies to her she was married to a british citizen uh, and both of her uh, sons um, hold british passports however she does hold three positions in the government um, she is the state counselor she's the minister of foreign affairs and she's also the minister of the president's office so we can Sometimes in the media, she's referred to as the de facto president. Um, now, she was interviewed in 2012 during a visit to the United States, and she was asked this very question, uh, how do you see the transition um, from military rule to democracy in Myanmar? And what she said was very interesting. She said, we have many, many lessons to learn from various places, not just the Asian countries like South Korea, Taiwan, Mongolia, and Indonesia, but also the Eastern European countries, which made the transition from communist autocracy to democracy in the 1980s and 1990s, and the Latin American countries, which made the transition from military governments. And then she pointed out that she also looks at the transition in South Africa uh, as a model. And then she said, we wish to learn from everybody who has achieved the transition to democracy. And our great strong point is that because we are so far behind everybody else, we can also learn which mistakes we should avoid. Uh, so she definitely sees her country as on the same path that all these other countries that were part of the third wave that the Dean referred to um, and she's hoping, obviously, that the transition will be successful. Now, this is my own view. Uh, I've, uh, I, I run a center for international development, and uh, so I work in many, many countries all over the world, and democratization and the rule of law are two of the areas where um, I try to provide assistance. And one of the lessons I've learned from my work is that without strong institutions, democracy will fail. So it's not enough to have a strong personality because individual leaders come and go. Uh, in order for democracy to be enduring, there must be institutions. And I think India is a good example of that. Um, that I think it's India's institutions that have made it the largest democracy and are the bedrock on, on which democracy is built here in India. So I'll talk about uh, four institutions and kind of where I think they are in the process of um, development. Uh, the executive, which includes both the presidency and the civil service. Then I'll say a few words about the courts. Then we'll turn to the parliament and finally a uh, short discussion of the status of political parties in Myanmar. All right, the presidency. Well, the, the first observation we can make is that it's a highly unstable situation. 
Uh, to say that you have a de facto president is a sign of weakness. Um, obviously, she very much depends on the cooperation of the president, uh, Ten Cha, and if they were to have a disagreement, uh, it's not clear what would happen. Now, you say, well, why, why don't the, why doesn't the NLD simply amend the Constitution and allow Aung San Suu Kyi to become president? Well, it's very, very difficult to amend the Constitution. Uh, the 2008 Constitution says any change has to be approved by 75% of the both houses of the parliament, and then there has to be a referendum. And the referendum has to be passed not by 50% of voters, but 50% of all registered voters. So it's a very, very difficult hurdle to jump. Now, I think all of you have read or heard about the recent assassination of the legal advisor to the NLD, Mr. Kony. And uh, he was a prominent Muslim lawyer in a Buddhist country. Uh, he also was a strong symbol of the democratic transition. He was assassinated at the uh, Rangoon Airport just a few days ago. And his position, and he came here to India and he gave uh, speeches uh, to this effect. He said, I do not favor amending the 2008 Constitution. I am in favor of writing a new Constitution. Right? So he was actually in the process of drafting a brand new Constitution for Myanmar when he was murdered. Now, when you look at the 2008 Constitution, uh, in the context of democracy, there are many features that stand out. Um, the first, of course, is that 25% of all the seats in both houses of parliament are reserved for the military. One third of the seats in the state and regional parliaments are reserved for the military. We saw that Aung San Suu Kyi is barred from the presidency. Very, very critical is this clause, which says that three of the ministries are also reserved for the military. And they were carefully selected. The Ministry of Defense, the Ministry of Home Affairs, which controls the police, and the Ministry of Border Affairs. As we've heard, there are ethnic conflicts along the borders and the military is fighting a civil war uh, in many of those border areas. So the border affairs is also under the control of the military. And we also saw how difficult it is to amend the Constitution. Now, Myanmar, under the current constitution, is a unitary state, but when you talk to the ethnic political parties, they all say what this country needs is federalism. And this is, again, a great theme um, and a great source of dispute uh, with the military wanting to maintain unitary control and the ethnic regions wanting um, decentralization of power. And when they talk about federalism, they have something very specific in mind. They want to control their own natural resources. Um, so when you think of federalism in the Myanmar context, you always have to think of the issue of the control over the natural resources. Um, the Civil War is still ongoing. There is a peace process. There was a uh, peace agreement signed last year, but not all of the ethnic groups signed. Uh, so they're still fighting in Rakhine State, still fighting in Kachin State. Um, but if there's going to be peace in Myanmar and stability in Myanmar, there has to be some kind of lasting solution found for this ethnic conflict. And probably federalism, which would require a new constitution um, or a change to the existing constitution, is a possible solution. Okay, here's a map of the country, and you can see that um, along the border areas are the minority ethnic groups. 
The Burmese um, majority live in the center, center of the country. You see Mandalay, Bago, Yangon. Uh, those are areas where the Burma majority is concentrated. Uh, Shan states, the largest of the states, uh, Kachin state you see there in the north, Rakhine state where the Rohingya live um, on the west. Um, so the border areas are uh, unstable at the current time. Now we'll turn to the civil service. Um, I'm really indebted to the former U.S. ambassador to uh, Burma, uh, Ms. Priscilla Clapp, for bringing this issue to my attention. She said that many people are not aware of how the military controls the administration of the country. Um, and there is an effort to try to professionalize the union civil service at, at the national level. And we're very grateful to the Hans Seidel Foundation from Germany for creating a, an academy, a public service academy to train civil servants, because remember, uh, that members of the National League for Democracy have no experience in government. Uh, so they're, they're, they're like the Trump administration, <laughs> uh, very new to government, and they, they, they need a lot, of, uh, a lot of professional development. So we have high hopes uh, for this uh, academy. But the military maintains tight control over the administration at the state and regional and township levels. Um, because they come under the Home Affairs Ministry, which as we saw is one of the ministries reserved to military control. Um, so there can be no real reform of the administration until um, civilians gain control over the uh, civil service at the local <laughs> level. Um, so right now, uh, and, and Kony was a very vocal advocate of reform of the civil service. And he gave many speeches and wrote many articles about the general administration department and how it need to be, needed to be brought under civilian control and how its powers had to be decentralized. So if you're looking at reasons why he was assassinated, this could be one reason right here. Who, he who controls the bureaucracy controls the country. Now we turn to the courts, and this is not a very happy tale at all. Uh, the judiciary is not independent. You cannot look to the courts to protect human rights. They are not going to resolve the Rohingya issue. Um, the courts, the Supreme Court, the highest court is still under the control of the military. Uh, the Chief Justice was a, was a former army officer himself, appointed by the previous president. Um, and uh, Aung San Suu Kyi has not been able to make any changes uh, to the judiciary. Um, there is a constitutional tribunal, but it's very inactive. Uh, the courts martial, uh, those are military courts. Uh, they operate in secret. We don't even know what they do. Um, and all our hopes are on the Supreme Court, but we don't really have too much hope there. Um, what the Supreme Court does actually do is use its power to control the lower courts, right? So they can dismiss judges, they can discipline judges, and so the Supreme Court maintains a tight grip on the uh, lower courts in Myanmar. Um, now, another problem is the parliament. The parliament passes laws, which obviously increases the jurisdiction of the courts, but what the parliament has done uh, has actually made the situation worse, and I'll tell you why. In 2014, um, the military regime introduced four bills. Uh, known collectively as the Race and Religion Protection Laws. And they were enacted last in 2015, uh, signed by Burma's president at that time, Maine Sane. And look at what these laws say. Uh, the law makes it a criminal offense to have more than one spouse. Now, who is that aimed at? 
the law makes it a criminal offense to live with an unmarried partner who is not a spouse. The law makes it illegal to engage in extramarital affairs. Uh, another law, the religious conversion law, requires that a Myanmar citizen who wishes to change his or her religion must obtain approval from a newly established registration board for religious conversion. Now this law is milder than the one in Afghanistan, where Julie and I also work, and it says that if someone converts from Islam to any other religion, that is a crime of apostasy punishable by death. Um, so at least the law in Myanmar is not quite as uh, severe. Uh, interfaith marriages uh, are regulated now by the government under the new law. And the fourth law on population control imposes on women in certain regions the requirement that they must space the birth of their children by at least 36 months. Um, now the United States is very critical of these laws. Um, people in the international human rights community have spoken up against them. And again, you say, well, why hasn't the NLD repealed these laws? But they haven't, right? So we've already talked a little bit about uh, the Chief Justice, U Tan Tan U, and um, he still remains in his position, even though he was appointed by the military government and was a former army officer himself. Uh, he also uh, selects the judges, as we saw, of the state and regional high courts. All right, look at this photograph. What strikes you is interesting. This is the photograph of the lower house of the Myanmar parliament. A lot of soldiers, huh? <laughs> Yeah, you notice that? Okay, they sit together as a block. That's right, yeah. If, if we had taken the photograph from the other side, you would see all the people in white and very few soldiers, right? But this, this photograph exaggerates or highlights the military presence. Yeah, that's a good point, yeah. So uh, Myanmar is a bicameral uh, legislature with a House of Nationalities and the House of Representatives. Uh, House of Representatives has 440 members, but only 330 are elected. What about the other 110? Who are they? Well, they're soldiers. Uh, so the Constitution says that 110 seats are reserved for defense services personnel chosen by the commander in chief of the defense forces. Um, and of course, all serve five year terms. Now we say that legislatures in democracies have three basic functions, uh, representation of constituents, oversight of the executive branch of government and making laws. But we, we talked earlier about how um, the new civil servants selected by the NLD are novices to government, not knowing exactly what their job is or how to perform their duties. It, the same can be said of the members of parliament. There was an 87% turnover in the 2015 election. Um, so almost most of the MPs have no experience performing any of these functions. They don't know what it means to represent constituents. They don't know how to oversee the executive branch. They don't know how to make laws. Now fortunately, uh, the United Nations has stepped in and did provide some training for the new MPs when they took office uh, last year. Uh, and they have set up a, an institute uh, to provide continuing uh, education and training for uh, the members of parliament. 
and this is called the United Nations Parliamentary Assistance Program. I'm also happy to report that India has uh, provided assistance. Uh, Julie and I visited uh, Mandalay University uh, recently, and the um, head of the International Relations Department told me that she was about to take a group of MPs to New Delhi to visit um, their Indian counterpart. So India is helping as well. Um, there's also assistance coming from the, uh, the uh, Europe, the IPU, which is headquartered in um, Geneva, Switzerland. And uh, this effort is funded by governments of Finland, Sweden, and the UK. Now, this is where we come in. Uh, the United States uh, Embassy asked me to work with the Yangon School of Political Science, and that was a uh, NGO uh, formed by former political prisoners. And once they were released from prison, they set up this school, and this was the first institution to offer classes in political science since 1962. Uh, so I was a Fulbright professor there uh, last year, and in the November 2015 elections, three of the five board members were elected to parliament. So in October of last year, uh, during one of my visits, um, several leaders of the NLD asked to meet with me, and this is what they said. They said, you know, we really have enjoyed the training that the UN has provided to us and that the Europeans have given us, but it doesn't really meet our needs. Uh, they talk in general terms about how parliaments work in the UK and in Finland, but that doesn't really help us very much. What we really need is uh, some kind of uh, training on what our powers, what our authority, what our duties are under the Myanmar Constitution. Uh, and secondly, we're, we're the union parliament, but there are 14 state and regional parliaments. They also need assistance because they also have NLD majorities who have never been in uh, parliament before. So, so they've asked us to step in and we're now working with the US government uh, to develop a program that will address these two needs, to make the training more uh, contextual for what they need, and secondly, to reach down to the state and regional assemblies. Uh, the state and regional parliaments uh, obviously vary in size depending on the population of the states. Uh, it's quite remarkable that the ethnic political parties join for the most part with the NLD, and so these regional parliaments also have uh, NLD majorities, um, and there's only uh, two exceptions. Uh, in Shan State, the NLD shares power with the USDP, the uh, former party affiliated with the military, which still has seats in the uh, Union Parliament. And in Rakhine State, the NLD does share power there with the Arakan National Party. Other than the other 12, the NLD has a clear majority. Now, finally, political parties. Um, again, these are very weak institutions. Uh, the first problem you notice about, the, well, the first problem you notice is there are very few national parties. So you have the USDP and you have NLD. The other parties are ethnic parties that only represent a region of the country, not the whole country. Uh, the NLD's weakness is that it relies on the leadership of one person, Aung San Suu Kyi. If she were to leave the scene, it's not clear what would happen. Would the NLD hold together? Would it fall apart? Um, who can name any other NLD leader besides her? Um, so that, that's a weakness relying on the leadership of one person. The USDP has been discredited. Uh, it has very little support um, outside the military. Uh, and then every single major ethnic group has its own political party. 
uh, Julie and I have spoken to some of the leaders of the ethnic parties. Uh, some of them don't even speak Burmese. You know, uh, it's sort of like India with so many different uh, ethnic groups and religions and um, not religions here so much, but ethnic groups and languages. Uh, and nine of the ethnic parties do have seats, even in the current uh, parliament. So my conclusion then is if when one looks at democratic transition from the point of view of the strength of institutions, we can say that some progress has been made for sure, but there are many, many warning signs and that the process of building strong democratic institutions has a long way to go. And the hurdles, the obstacles are extremely severe. And whether Aung San Suu Kyi herself uh, can lead the country over those obstacles it remains to be seen. Uh, when we look at other examples of uh, countries in Asia, that had military governments and then attempted the transition to democracy, it's both uh, hopeful and sobering. We can say that in South Korea, Taiwan, Philippines, uh, there was success. Indonesia, there was success. But the example of Thailand is very sobering indeed. Um, so obviously, Myanmar is a country um, that will continue to need strong international support. Uh, the United States and India are obviously both strongly committed to helping make that democratic transition both successful and enduring. So thank you very much. But, um, but, so we might, sorry, my name is my program here on population and stability. So I'll start from this point. Uh, what do you mean by stability? And I've seen in your slides, in one part, and you proceed on Myanmar, not a stable country. So you mean what you really mean by, by, by stable? And I, I guess you are taking this institutional perspective to analyze your, your position right to stability. The second and last point that I would like to take it as a David's advocate. That your concept of the definition of democracy is highly Eurocentric or Americanized perspective. Why do I say that? Uh, if I call a military diplomacy a democracy in Myanmar, I be out of the, the heart or something crazy to allow me. Why should I say that democracy is only when you have uh, militaries out of political, political life? This is my second and last, last point just to start. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Thank you. Hey, thank you, Carlton. That uh, was a great question. Uh, stability, uh, so yeah, you can talk about economic stability, social stability, there are different types of stability. I'm looking at stability from the point of view of institutions. And, um, and you're probably right that I'm looking at it from sort of an America-centric point of view. Uh, for example, in the United States, we pride ourselves on the peaceful transition of power you know, every four years we have a presidential election. The president can only serve two terms, so there's a transition from one party to another party, one president to another president, at least every eight years. So for us, that's a sign of stability, transition. Um, so obviously it's uh, too early to tell what will happen in Myanmar um, with regard to presidential transition. If the next elections will be in 2020, um, but, uh, you know, so that's, that's my point of view is the stability of the, of the institutions themselves. And obviously military coups, that's destabilizing. I mean, that, that's a sign that the system is not working at all, right? Um, so if the military steps in out of fear that the country is falling apart, then that would be a sign of failure, obviously. 
So when we talk about the rule of law, that's also what we mean, you know, is that there are these peaceful, lawful transitions of, of power. And that, you know, justices don't stay in power after their term in, members of part. So everybody follows the rules of the Constitution, obviously. So that would be a sign of stable institutions. Now, with regard to the other question about uh, can you have a democracy where the military plays a major role, again, from just looking at it from an American point of view, the answer would be no, because we always pride ourselves on civilian control of the military. Uh, and we think this is a fundamental principle of democracy, is the civilian control. And also, I should point out that when I talk about democracy, I'm talking about not Greek democracy, you know, uh, because a democracy as it was first developed in ancient Greece was what we would call pure democracy, where the people ruled, the people themselves ruled, so, um, and it was ruled by a majority vote. I don't mean that. When, when I mean democracy, I mean what we call representative democracy, where the people elect individuals to represent them in a legislature. And secondly, that the regime guarantees the rights of individuals. So freedom of speech, freedom of the press, um, the rights of those charged with crimes, that uh, there are fundamental freedoms that the Constitution protects against the majority. So it's a qualified democracy, a democracy that, that guarantees the rights of individuals. Um, so that's how I'm viewing it. Question? Uh, there is a transition from one political system to another political system. It's always very difficult. Uh, so some of the variables are within the country. Some factors are very important within the country. Some factors are outside of the country, uh, what we call as geopolitical variables. Now, as far as Burma goes, uh, these variables include India and China relations. There has always been a uh, uh, and pull uh, between these two countries, geopolitical. Now, you have mentioned that uh, India, along with some European countries, is providing some assistance. Uh, but uh, what about the geopolitical dimensions, and how, what, respect, uh, what role is China playing in this? Uh, uh, how does China see a country going from a military dictatorship uh, to uh, democratic, how does they, how do they look at this uh, transition? Yeah, that's an excellent question. Uh, I first heard about Myanmar when uh, someone from the U.S. State Department said to me, you know, the Burmese are becoming afraid of China, and we think this is an opening for us. Uh, because what actually happened was um, there was a very close relationship between the military and China. And so Chinese companies were allowed to come in to Burma and extract natural resources. For example, when Julie and I were there recently, we were told that by some uh, merchants that the Chinese have extracted most of the jade from Burma and, and brought it to China. So natural gas, oil, um, all kinds of minerals have been extracted by the Chinese. But what I was told by the State Department was that the military themselves in Myanmar were becoming concerned about domination by the Chinese. And so they were beginning to look toward other powers as a counter to Chinese, growing Chinese influence in the country. And the United States and obviously India are two powerful nations that could be allies. So you could analyze what, what has happened in Burma purely from a geopolitical point of view, just as you point out, that this democratization, this democratic transition is actually an attempt by the country to find counters to growing Chinese influence. Now, how do the Chinese view that? Uh, they're not very happy, I don't think. Um, for example, they've created these, um, oh, they call them uh, the pearls of the Orient, you know, these ports all around, like in Pakistan, uh, Gwadar, Port of Gwadar. Uh, the Chinese have developed one in uh, Burma as well. So the Chinese have developed a whole system of ports and uh, highways and railways to 
try to ex maximize the extraction of resources from Africa, uh, from Asia. Uh, so I think the Chinese uh, feel this has been a setback for them to some extent, um, but we'll have to wait, wait and see. Um, but that seems to be part of the motivation for what's going on is a fear of, of growing Chinese influence. Yeah, uh, but my own view of that is that um, she can't really accomplish anything without the military support. And that's one, that's one element, right? The second problem is that she needs the support of the Burmese ethnic majority. And so the um, Rohingya issue and the Muslim issue uh, are very, uh, they're, they're almost like traps for her, right? Because if she were to be perceived by the Burmese majority as favoring the Muslims or favoring the Rohingya, then she might lose popular support. And so she's trying to maintain both military support and popular support from the ethnic Burmese majority. And she feels if she loses either one, she won't be able to accomplish anything. Uh, transition suggests uh, stability. So don't you think that uh, having a direct uh, kind of democracy as well as a, a democracy or as an institution where the number of military experts is reduced whereas the, in the parliament the number of uh, representatives is increased would increase the stability and increase progress as well? Because, as you rightly suggested, that uh, military leaders don't really know what they're uh, dealing with. So, don't you think that progress, in the natural sense of it, is more important than progress for just namesake? Uh, well, uh, let me uh, try to um, answer that question. I, I think what you're suggesting is that, well, let's look at it this way. If 110 members of the lower house of parliament are soldiers, then they can't participate in any debates. They can't really uh, express their own personal opinions. They're soldiers, they do what they're ordered to do. So it's almost like they could be one person, right? Uh, the 110 could be one person because that one person will be the commander in chief of the armed forces. Uh, obviously the more individuals who are in the parliament who feel free to think on their own and free to form positions on policy issues on their own, the more true democracy you will have. Um, and so to me, democracy should be deliberative. There should be real debate and real discussion. So under the transition and uh, the changes that have come, the challenges that have come, uh, you spoke of like a crackdown of student unions. So how has the uh, role of these grassroots level uh, organizations of public opinion like student unions, labor unions, and other kind of civil society organizations, grassroots level development organizations. How has the role of these organizations changed and what do you foresee in the future? Yes, no, that's also a very uh, appropriate question. Um, as I said, you know, my first involvement with civil society was with former political prisoners. And what they told me when I first met them was, you know, we have a dilemma. We're used to being revolutionaries. We're used to being you know, uh, critics of the government, and now we're being asked to join the NLD and become parts of the government. And uh, I remember Julie and I had dinner with one of the uh, YSPS uh, board members recently, and he just broke down in our discussion, and he said, I was so much more comfortable being a radical and an activist than I am now. <laughs> so it's a, it's a big jump, it's a big leap for somebody to go from being an enemy of the regime to being in the regime. Um, yeah. This is a new president, and you know, like the secretary, uh, secretary Clinton and uh, Aung San Suu Kyi were very close friends, and Secretary Clinton visited Myanmar like uh, two times. So I think, what do you think, what would be the new relationship between Mr. Trump president, uh, Mr. Trump government and 
Yeah, you know, uh, this is one of those questions where you really need a crystal ball. <laughs> and my, when, I, when I was watching the election returns and I realized that Mr. Trump was going to win, my first question was, what does this mean for U.S. policy, you know, toward Burma? And uh, the first thought that came to me was related to your question, and that is, well, you notice Trump has been uh, very uh, critical of China, you know, and China's uh, influence in the South China Sea. And you notice how friendly Trump has been toward Russia. And you could see his overtures toward Putin as an effort to, you know, cause a rift between Russia and China. So if that's true, then he should be supportive of the democratic transition in Myanmar because that would kind of bring Myanmar into the American orbit you know, to a greater extent and, and would try to uh, you know, create a barrier between Myanmar and uh, China. So, but it's too early to tell. We don't know yet. Have to stay tuned. <laughs> Has it in any way affected uh, them or a uh, growing uh, religiosity among Nihonkas or has political Islam, how is political Islam, has it been able to create any roots there or like, has there been any sort of reaction against the persecution which emanates more from the Muslim identity rather than say? Yes. yes. Uh, I think one way to start the discussion is to acknowledge that there is now political Buddhism in the country. That, that's an observation you can see very clearly. Uh, some of the um, anti-Muslim agitation is led by Buddhist monks, for example. Um, so there is, I, I, I've traveled in many Buddhist countries, this is the first political Buddhism I guess I've, I've seen myself. With regard to the Muslims, uh, as you know, uh, Myanmar was obviously part of uh, British India, and so many of the Muslims who live there now came um, to what is now Myanmar as part of the British India Civil Service. So they, you know, uh, the professional class of Muslims has been in the country for a very long time. They're not, from, from my observation, they're not very political at all. Um, but I think you're right that uh, because of the Rohingya issue, it's, it's being exploited by perhaps outside groups, you know, um, uh, that have, you know, political Islamic agendas. Uh, so I think it's a fairly new element in the, in the equation is this uh, involvement by outside um, you know, ex Islamic extremists. And I think that makes the situation more dangerous than it was before. There seems to be um, no change in the culture of impunity of the armed forces um, dealing with civilians, uh, not just the Rohingya, but generally. So, I mean, one would assume that there would be at least some directions from the higher-ups to check the abusive tendencies of the military. Uh, have you seen, at least in other regions maybe, if not in Rakhine, some kind of moderation on their behavior which shows that they are, if not, I mean, forget Geneva Conventions and such big things, but, you know, that they seem to be uh, softening or uh, are less harsh in their uh, approach to dealing with the society. I mean, is the military softening that iron grip or is it still that vicious animal as it used to be? In, in my conversations with uh, the leaders of the ethnic political parties, uh, especially with the, the female leaders, what they tell me is that whenever you start talking about uh, you know, army abuses of the ethnic minorities, she, the, what the women tell us is that you also have to be aware that our own militias abuse us. So I, I think it's a, maybe a cultural problem, that not, not just with the Myanmar military, but culturally, any armed group, the men in those armed groups do not respect human rights. Okay, let's have a second round. The last quick one. Uh, Professor, you uh, talked about the Americans thought that they had a 
the window into Burma once they saw that uh, the, uh, the Burmese military was uh, feeling uh, vulnerable in China. Uh, so do you think the idea of promoting democracy creates an American dilemma in the sense that if the military is not really interested in creating democracy, they want the support of the Americans against the Chinese, but they don't want democracy. But the Americans go there, if you want our support, you also have to bring about institutional changes. It creates a dilemma. And uh, so how does this impact this whole uh, uh, geopolitical issue? Does it stop now if the military is being now say democracy is more of a threat? If China also doesn't want this, so you said that Chinese don't find it really uh, nice that the Americans are coming uh, So will the military now change their perspective? Will the Chinese now reduce their uh, you know, uh, so-called vulnerable steps towards the military and so the military becomes more in support of the Chinese or become good buddies with the Chinese? And so it creates a different, a different uh, transition, different geopolitical situation. So how do you think this? Yeah, actually your question uh, leads me add another topic. <laughs> and that is that the, uh, because the military in Myanmar have been in power for so long, you know, since 1962, they have actually emulated the Chinese People's Liberation Army by gaining control over resources. So there are many businesses, um, a lot of land, a lot of uh, mines that are actually owned or controlled by the military, and they often operate through their civilian partners who are called cronies. Um, in fact, for example, when Julie and I uh, go to Myanmar and we have to choose a hotel, we always have to ask our friends in civil society which hotel should we stay in, because they know which ones are owned by cronies of the military and which ones are not. Um, and they're bugging their applying on guests in their institutions? Well, they, the civil society organizations don't want to support the cronies. Oh, okay. Yeah, it's just that, that yeah. Um, but what this means, I think, is that if the military can be satisfied, that they'll continue to be able to benefit you know, from these uh, investments, from these businesses, then they'll be more willing to give up power. Now, are they likely to turn back toward China? Um, I, I would say there's so much anger among the uh, people of Myanmar against the exploitation of the Chinese that that's not likely to happen. It would just uh, you know, delegitimize the, the military even more because the people themselves feel that the Chinese have exploited uh, Myanmar and uh, they have a lot of animus, not toward Chinese individually, but toward China itself. Yeah. Okay, last one, please. Thank you. I, I just want to make my comment. I won't try to replace it. Uh, because uh, if you look at these transitions, you have to see what kind of values you want to highlight more. Is it democracy or is it stability that you want to, to, to take as a priority? And if you take democracy, democracy for whom? And stability for whom? It has been pointed survival of these military who have been in power for well, so long. They won't live unless they ensure themselves that they have their survival there. So at this point, uh, it's doing that in Myanmar with all these kind of instabilities, institutional and even the prevalence of violence in the country. I think that uh, all these institutional arrangements that we place now is more to ensure stability instead of argument rather than to ensure first democracy in the first place. So this is my take on my statement and look at this whole scenario. Thank you. Okay, that's a good point. Uh, I would hope that we don't have to choose. Can we have both? <laughs> Uh, before we end uh, this uh, session, I just want to say thank you to Professor Holland. Of course, uh, as I said, I was a student back in 2003, 2004, and I'm proud to be a part of the Boston University at some point. And, I, and I'm very glad that he accepted our invitation. Hopefully, we'll 
come back later. And if everything goes well, and f for now we are not very, we are in a dilemma because of the Trump administration just coming up. What happens is that we're applying for a grant with the State Department. If everything goes well, uh, we'll be working in uh, Myanmar for uh, some kind of training. So that's a project we are looking forward to. And hopefully that things would uh, come up in a positive way. And also I want to thank students and uh, faculty colleagues who are here uh, accepting an invitation to join this session. And I hope you enjoy. And if there is any, any questions that you might have, if the speaker didn't answer or have, has no time to answer it, I'm here. I'm available to answer those questions because I'm also an expert on Myanmar democratization process. Thank you very much.